Thirteen years ago, the Drug Enforcement Administration came up with a new way to fight its war against drugs, a sting called Operation Swordfish. Here's how it worked. The DEA opened a bogus investment company in Miami to lure big-time drug traffickers to launder their money by investing in stocks, bonds, and real estate, assets the DEA could later seize. To make the sting work, the DEA would need an undercover spy good enough to infiltrate the Colombian drug mafia. The DEA found their confidential informant, that spy they needed, in Cuban immigrant Robert Darius. Or rather, he found them. Economically, I needed a job. It didn't matter if it was $1,000 a month, $2,000 a month, or $200,000 a month. I needed a job. And that's what I asked them for. Bob Darius walked into the DEA one day and basically said, where do I sign? I want to be a DEA agent. Miles Malman was the federal prosecutor who tried and won two major drug cases based on Darius's work in Operation Swordfish. Your typical informant is someone who is arrested and then is pressured by the authorities into cooperating. Darius was not like that. He didn't have the baggage that many informants have of the uh, a substantial criminal record. Secondly, he's very intelligent and he's very articulate, very convincing, very charming. He was a businessman. He was a salesman and he was a good salesman. A good salesman with tax problems. After failing to pay $29,000 in taxes from a bungled real estate deal, he was sentenced to two and a half months in jail. Years later, with interest and penalties, that $29,000 had become almost $300,000. I was desperate, and I felt that uh, after thinking and thinking, what I'm going to do now. That's when he turned to the DEA and became a spy. Because of his undercover work, Darius and his wife Amelia are still afraid the Colombian drug mafia will try to kill them. They agreed to be interviewed only if they could be disguised. We were already in a desperate situation, and when the opportunity arose that he could work for the government, we saw that as a light at the end of the tunnel, because we were you know, in very bad uh, shape financially and emotionally. So Darius needed the DEA as much as they needed him. It seemed the perfect match. Darius knew Miami where he lived and Columbia where he had once worked as a legitimate businessman. The DEA set up its phony investment company in this Miami Lakes office complex. Darius was paid $4,000 a month to help lure drug traffickers here where they could be secretly recorded making transactions to launder money. The woman on this tape was one of the biggest fish hooked in the swordfish sting, Marlena Navarro. Prosecutors called her the chief financial officer in North America for one of the world's biggest Colombian cocaine cartels. They said her job was to launder and transport drug money back to Colombia and to help coordinate the distribution of cocaine. Never for a minute did she suspect Darius was a DEA agent. I trust him very deeply. I didn't have brothers, so for me he was my big brother. I trusted him so much, and uh, I didn't have quite reason to have a, a suspicious about something going wrong. But something did go wrong for Navarro. The drug money she laundered through Darius led the DEA to more than three dozen arrests and the seizure of hundreds of pounds of cocaine and millions of dollars in assets. She got a 32-year prison sentence, and her boss, Colombian drug kingpin Carlos Alvarez, got 45. I've described Darius's role in these cases as significant, critical, and his performance was uh, as an informant or as an operative or as a witness was uh, heroic. Heroic? Yes. Why? Because Darius had been threatened. His family was living under great pressure. His uh, marriage and personal life was suffering, and uh, he was suffering all of these uh, uh, misfortunes as a result of his participation. It's been horrible, and uh, the betrayal was very deep. And uh, so when you go to a war, and this can be considered a type of war, you don't think you're going to be betrayed by your own side, and we were. 
Why do they feel betrayed? For his dangerous and productive work, Darius says the DEA made three promises. They would pay him full salary through all the swordfish trials, pay him a $100,000 bonus, and most importantly, they would eliminate his tax problem. So the, the bottom line was that they said they would pay you through the trial. You say they did not. No. They said they would give you a bonus. You never got that bonus. No. They said they would take care of your IRS problem. Did they? They didn't. I took care of my IRS problem. Uh, he was compensated, I think, fairly. Robert Bonner ran the Drug Enforcement Administration from 1990 until just recently. He was not at the DEA during Swordfish, but the agency declined our request to interview the agents who worked with Darius. I realize Mr. Darius uh, is dissatisfied uh, with the amount of compensation he received, but I think a good many people will think that uh, you know, this is taxpayers' money too. They may think we paid him too much. So what was Darius paid by the DEA? Their receipts show that they did not pay him through the trials as promised. They stopped paying his salary in March of 1984, three years before he finished testifying in his sixth and last swordfish trial. That means that Darius's income averaged about $25,000 a year for his six-year DEA obligation, about half of what Darius says they promised. In addition, he says the DEA reneged on its commitment to solve his tax debt and give him a bonus. I think DEA made every possible effort to come through on those things, both with respect to the IRS liability, the the lump sum payment of $100,000, uh, he ultimately was paid uh, $73,000, which went right, uh, to, which the went right to the IRS mm -hmm. to settle that tax which claim. Which didn't solve his tax debt, by the way. I mean, well, take, I understood if, that it had totally well, resolved if, his tax if, liability. If take a look it didn't. In addition to turning over the bonus check, Darius had to agree to pay the IRS a hefty percentage of his income for another six years. And remember, his original tax debt was $29,000. I wouldn't call that taking care of my tax problem. My understanding had been that his tax liability that he had uh, when he first arrived at DEA's door back in around 1981 had been uh, totally resolved with his payment. That may not be the case, in which well, case uh, that's, uh, that's news to me. Not only did the DEA fail to solve Darius's tax debt, but according to IRS policy, the DEA was not authorized to make that kind of promise in the first place so that either the DEA agents didn't know what they were doing or they lied to Darius. No, I don't think so. I mean, we did intervene and we do intervene on behalf, on occasion. On behalf well, they say that they're not the supposed two. to make those kinds of promises. Well, yeah, we don't have authority to compromise a civil tax claim. That, that's true. DEA doesn't have that. Only the IRS has that. Most informants are going to be used until they're used up. And Roberto Darius falls into that category. Alcee Hastings, now a congressman, was the judge in both the Alvarez and Navarro trials. Do, do you think he was treated fairly by the Drug Enforcement Administration? Absolutely not. I knew just as sure as shooting that he was going to be put in the streets. That once they have used him, they're going to throw him out and he's going to be left to his own devices. Thus, I suspect wherever he is today, there um, are guns in his nightstand and padlocks on his door and constant paranoia. Uh, this happens um, over and over again with snitches. Hastings is no stranger to snitches and informants. He was once the target of a government informant in a bribery investigation that resulted in his removal from the bench. If he was made promises by the DEA, and he is a snitch, are they bound to keep those promises? Only if it's in writing. Only if it's in writing. The DEA's promises are not in writing, but they are on tape. To the surprise of the DEA, Robert Darius not only recorded his conversations with the bad guys, the drug dealers, he also recorded all of his phone conversations with the good guys, the DEA agents. Author David McClintock relied upon over 300 hours of those tapes to write a book on Operation Swordfish. The audio tapes document and prove that the promises were made, not once, but repeatedly. Over time, the accumulation of winks, nods, arched eyebrows, and explicit statements add up to promises. And on several occasions, they were quite explicit.
as in this taped excerpt from one of Darius's conversations with Agent Carol Cooper. Hopefully at the end we can take care of your tax problem, number one. Right. I think whatever you get at the end, you're going to be able to live very, very comfortably. As far as, you know, take care of you in the meantime during the trial. Right. Uh, I don't think there's any problem with any of that. This is the worst nightmare of a, of a government spy bureaucracy, to have one of its spies, in effect, turn around and spy on the people controlling him. Making those audio recordings was illegal in Florida. So why did Darius risk a felony conviction to record the agents in the first place? He says he needed insurance after DEA agents lost evidence, botched assignments, and began fighting among themselves. As soon as they started creating problems in the office and arguments in the office, and I realized that I was dealing with little kids, not with men, I thought, these guys are handling a lot of money. And if something goes wrong, I am going to be the one who is going to be blamed for everything. Besides the fact that they, they told me, tape everybody. And they didn't realize that by everybody, they were including themselves. Anybody who, who volunteers his or her services to a United States government spy bureaucracy or law enforcement bureaucracy had better watch out because it is in the nature of that bureaucracy to treat the individual badly after it has gotten whatever it wants from him or her. Um, that is the unfortunate fact of life. Well, I'd, I'd hate for that message to be the message that was, uh, was sent out because uh, DEA does, uh, does get information from a lot of different sources. Uh, we, do, uh, we do pay money for that information on occasion. Sometimes it's uh, just good and interested citizens who want to provide information to DEA. Uh, and I think we try to take care of people that do help us. But Darius says the DEA hasn't taken care of him. Since 1984, he has been supported by his wife. She works and help from her family. He's worked only occasionally and still lives in seclusion in Florida. Robert, you feel that the government let you down? Yes. I would like them to, to pay what they owe me. But even if, if they don't, I don't want them to do the same thing they did to me to anybody else. Amelia, what do you want now from the government? I want to be forgotten. All it has brought me is pain and misery. I don't want them even to remember me, that I ever existed. And that's the opposite of what you want. I want them to remember me forever. Really, and I'm going to make sure that they remember me for a long time. Darius has refused the DEA's offer to go in the witness protection program, and he plans to sue for the money he says they owe him. As for Marlena Navarro, after almost eight years in prison, she was granted a new trial because of administrative errors in the court transcription. But Darius says he won't testify against her unless he's subpoenaed. And that's not likely to happen since the federal prosecutors have now agreed to a plea bargain with Navarro that could see her out of prison next year.